Have you been enjoying learning about the four pillars? Pretty profound, hey? I was talking with our worship team on Thursday night. We were talking about it and we were just loving how this, like we've been, this has been our heart and our DNA in this community, well, as long as I've been here. And just to put language to it has just brought so much clarity and it's been so helpful and it's just wonderful. So I'm so glad that we're doing it and breaking it down for you. It's kind of a big task to take such broad things, like broad, broad, broad. We've got an apostle sitting at the head here. That's the way apostles think, it's very broad. And then just to bring it down into something that we could impart and equip you guys with. It's taken a lot of hours, just so you know. (laughs) All right, so we have been, can I have the four pillars up? So we've been covering uh, making and maturing disciples of Jesus, um, building healthy church family, transforming the city of Rockingham. And today we're going to cover the covering the region through prayer. Now, it's really important to note, and I know um, Brad, Amy and Greg have all said about how they all are actually part of one another. And I just want to re-emphasize that again, that it's not step one, then I get that all done, and then I go step two to family, I get that all done, and then I go into step three, city, get that all done, and then step four, the region, get that all done, and then tick us all done and we're, yoo-hoo, awesome. It's not like that. They're actually not steps at all. They're all married together. And so they all flow together. And it's quite stunning to think that it requires family to raise mature disciples. It takes maturing disciples to transform a city. It takes mature disciples to cover a region through prayer or maturing I should say, because we're forever maturing and it's not like a, yay, I'm mature and that's it. Um, We will be maturing until the day we die. So celebrate that. It's good for humility (laughs) that we realise that. And so none of them can exist without the other. And so um, if you kind of knew her, Um, Brad covered a while ago, you know, what our history as a community has been. Um, But I think it was about in 2016 that the Lord spoke to Brad saying that he was giving him a regional mandate. Now, when you're a leader of a house or of a place, any sphere, in a family, when the Lord gives a word for you, it's for those also that are under your influence. It's not just for me. It's those that the Lord has entrusted to me as well. Okay? So when Brad gave that word, sorry, when the Lord gave Brad that word, he gave this house that word. Okay? So since then, we have been learning how to steward that word. It's a rather rather hefty task that the Lord has entrusted to us with. And it carries a weightiness to it of the fear of the Lord, but also of honour and respect. Like we need to respect the mandate that the Lord has given us and take it seriously. It's not something that it's like, oh, I don't feel like doing that today or you, you can do that, Brad. We'll just be over here doing our own little thing. It's this house carries that call. And so... What I want to do today is just kind of open your eyes up a bit wider. For some, you may know this material, this stuff, but for many, there's just really not an understanding of the spiritual realm as such. And so we're just going to just, it's not going to be a full, like, massive teaching on it because you could teach for a very long time on the spirit realm. But this is just going to be an insight and it's particular to our region, okay? Okay. My first one is I want you to know that the enemy is intentionally and actively working against you, against your family, against the church you attend, against the pastors that oversee you, against every plan that the Lord has. Satan has set up strategies to throw you off course. 
That's his assignment. If he can rob, if he can kill, if he can destroy, he's doing it. And he has people that actively will do that. Like we have intercessors, Satan's realm has intercessors. Like we have blessings, they have curses. And because they take their realm seriously, they have power and they have impact. And this is the reality that we live in. We are in a spiritual war all the time. All the time. It is embedded in our culture, in our systems, in all the seven mountains. It's embedded in the structures of them at heart generally are demonic. So Jesus comes in and he goes, and I am going to redeem it all. This has been my scripture for, I don't know, a few months now. And it's Proverbs 21, 22. And it says, a warrior filled with wisdom ascends into the high place and releases regional breakthrough, bringing down the strongholds of the mighty. That's you and I. That's you and I. But we need to see ourselves a little bit differently because a warrior isn't passive. A warrior has self-discipline, has self-control, has the fruits of the Spirit functioning in their lives. Their fruit, they're because of the root, just so you know. That's not a behaviour. Um, but a warrior takes it seriously. And has a little bit of sometimes intensity to them. So I apologise if this comes across a little intense. It's not my my desire. But the Lord entrusts them then to go into the high places and bring down regional strongholds. And I want you to know that that's not just for the church to benefit. That's for the people who don't know the Lord to benefit. Um. I went to uh, Redding, California, Bethel, uh, 2016 actually, and literally laying in my bed, I could hear the Lord so clearly just dropping, asking me questions, revelation like I've not experienced before. But it's because they've stewarded something in that region. They have intercessors. They have prayer. They have worship. They have an apostolic covering. They're, they do fivefold all these things enable for anybody then who doesn't know the Lord to encounter the gospel of the kingdom and to actually receive it because their hearts are open and that blanket that was once over them blocking and hindering is not there anymore. And so that's what we want to do here. That is our desire. That is the Lord's desire. And so Ephesians 6.12 says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Um, In the Passion Translation, it says, Your hand-to-hand combat is not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they are a powerful class of demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. So you can see that it's actually like there's um, angelic hierarchy. There's also demonic as well. Okay. And so we have demons, which are the, you know, spirit of fear, uh, intimidation, torment, uh, infirmity, sickness. Like all those things, I kind of call them the bottom dwellers. (laughs) They're the ones that you and I, on our own, have the authority to go and bind and kick out the door and to loose the heavenly realms into that space. So a sound mind for the spirit of fear. Praise for heaviness. 
joy for mourning. And so the Lord wants to do like that, that transaction. So it's not enough that we just go, I just bind that spirit of fear right now and I drive you out. It's, that's one, that's step one. But step two is, and I ask that you would bring your shalom peace, God. So we're always replacing. So those ones, go for gold. Go for it. But when it comes to territorial spirits, we're talking about another class of demonic influence. And they're the ones that would, territorial would be like over a region. So specifically over this region, so region being uh, Perth, Rockingham, Baldivis, Mandra, Peel area. Um, probably the two main territorial spirits are Python and Leviathan. So python comes to constrict like a, like a natural python would, right? So think of constricting, strangling, so it affects the breath. So that's even the prophetic, the ruach breath of God. It affects, like tries to rob your speech, your voice. Um, prophetic movements, it will try to strangle it out and shut it down. You also see it in the natural realm as like asthma, hard breathing, lung issues, strangulation, things like that. Okay, so that's the, path, that's the influence of the Python spirit. Leviathan is called in Scripture the king of pride. So every haughty thing like Scripture refers to, that's part of Leviathan. It's stubborn can't be moved, won't be moved. It is, um, thinks it's better than, has superiority complex. Um, what else? Heart of heart. Unrepentant. Just all those kind of things. You think, you can, pride just has so many facets to it, okay? That's the influence of Leviathan, so our hearts can come into agreement with either of these entities because we're living under them. We're under their influence. And so quite often with the sanctification journey, as the Lord's are literally just unhooking our soul from these entities. Like we're, through the process of repentance, we're coming out of agreement with them and we're actually separating ourselves from them. And it reminds me of um, when the Lord brought, brought the Hebrews out of Egypt. They come out from under a system. They come out from under slavery. They were under something. And so that's what the Lord wants to do with his people and the people out there is bring them out from under the influence of these entities. Okay, so then we have principalities that cover a much larger region again. Um, and rulers of darkness are hidden behind people um, like those secret organizations that you can never quite find the head of. So sex slave trade, pornography industry, just those kind of things where it's just kind of rampant, but there's not like it's one person at the head. So with territorial spirits, they hold a region captive to strongholds. Um, so the people that live there will think a certain way and act a certain way. And we will see um, within a region, you'll see similar attributes in the people group that live there. Um, so I looked up uh, the stats that Greg shared last week. And so I'm going to use the city of Rockingham as an example. Um, so we could see the fruit of poverty, self-centeredness, truancy, stealing and domestic violence. They're the fruit and when I was sitting there going to the Lord, I'm like, Lord, okay, what's the enemy's goal here? And he just said, he's robbing a future and a hope. That's what his goal is, is to rob a future and a hope. Because with each generation, it'll just spiral down further and further and further. But one of the things, like he said to me, um, you know how I was just talking about how we come under the influence of a region and so it'll have its hooks in us. The one that stood out to me the most... Uh, Greg pointed out last week actually was self-centeredness. And 
I know for me personally, I am wrestling. I love family. I love this family. I love this house with my every breath. But I am constantly wrestling against self-centered thinking. And so if I am, I can guarantee all of us are. And it's like I'm my heart, my heart is genuinely prefer my neighbor, prefer someone else over me. And I serve. And it does come from my heart to genuinely serve. But in my mind, I when I'm alone, I'm thinking, how does this affect me? What am I going to do? What do I feel like doing today? And so that is a symptom of something that we're under. And it just, it really stood out to me, I think, because that's something that we have been really pressing on, especially when Amy did her um, building healthy church family, is self-centeredness has to go. But it's actually a part of the region we live in. But the Lord wants to deliver us from it too. (laughs) Oh, dear. So... What kind of holds us to those things is corporate strongholds. And it's when we, a corporate stronghold is, is you can have individual strongholds. So I will have, I kind of think of strongholds like a fortress. Um, You know, when someone would come up to go to war against, there's like this big thick wall of protection around its people um, and stops the enemy from being able to get in. Well, if you think of that fortress, it can be your beliefs about God or about yourself or, you know, just different beliefs that we have. And so if I have a belief that God is not good, then when the enemy comes in to rob, kill and destroy, he will use the the lie of, well, God's not good. And so then I just go, oh, he's not good. And he just comes in and he takes whatever he wants. But if I have a belief that says God is good, when the opposite comes up against it, it hits that wall. It hits up against the wall and it can't penetrate the wall. And I can just, like sometimes it's like a, oh, no, God's good, so no, I don't agree with it. And sometimes it's even less than that. It's just like a nick off thought, you know. (laughs) But a stronghold is an agreement that we have with good or bad. And so when we get corporate strongholds, it's a body of people, two or more, that are in agreement with something. And so just the same way, it can be good or bad. The thing is, is when it's bad, when it's negative, when it's demonic that we're, or self-interest that we're in a corporate stronghold with, When you go to leave that, you can guarantee you're going to know about it because there will be backlash. There will be opposition. There will be a a pointing out, like all of a sudden, everyone that was in that group was turns against you. And that's how you know you're in a corporate stronghold. (laughs) And it always comes in the form of punishment. I was just going to look at um, a really good example of this is in Acts 16, 16. So if you have your Bible. And what I love about this is it actually points out a corporate stronghold, the, um, the territorial spirit and how even like everything was aligned to it. Okay, so it's Paul and Silas. And as they were going to the place of prayer, they were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to, t- to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. But when the owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. 
The crowd joined in, attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. So here we can see that this woman, young woman, was operating in a spirit of divination. When you actually go to um, the original language, it's also Python. And so divination is – so this is a side note. This is a freebie. The spirit of divination mimics Holy Spirit, which you can see is like she's going around following and going, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. If you didn't, if you didn't read the rest of it or the, the part before it, you would think, well, she's telling the truth. So it took Paul to discern – that it actually wasn't Holy Spirit that was speaking. It was a spirit of divination slash python, okay? And so when they addressed it and they dealt with it and delivered her from it, the whole town went into an uproar. It just shows that it what was in her was connected to the regional territorial spirit. So much so that then they were beaten by the judicial system. They were beaten, they were hit, kicked, thrown into prison. So can you see how there's a connection with what happens in the territorial territorial spirit, regional realm, then on the earth, in the natural realm, like how it has that much influence and that much power? Okay. Um, another one I was thinking of is uh, when they went into Ephesus, I think it's in Acts, and they, um, they had mass revival where people actually came and burned all their books of witchcraft. And I can't remember the total amount that it equates to. But they saw, after that, they saw much fruit in that place. They saw salvations, miracles, healings, deliverance. Things just opened up because people just repented and burnt all their stuff. All right. So you can go after the demons that are harassing you and your family. As an individual on your own, you cannot go after territorial spirits. You will get eaten alive. (laughs) They have that much influence that they will, they, there will actually be, what's the word, backlash. There will be, you can, there could be sickness, there could be, it impacts your family, stuff like, just horrible stuff can happen because you've interfered with something without wisdom. Even the way you pray for Python is not the same way you would pray for Leviathan. They're actually totally opposite pretty much. And so we only go after those territorial and principalities corporately as a number of us together in unity, in agreement and with the leading of Holy Spirit. We don't go in there wildly waving a sword around, just whacking anything that comes near us, but we go in like a warrior with wisdom. It takes skill and obedience to the Lord to deal with this level of um, demonic entities. It's different though when you say if you're anointed and appointed for it. So what Brad can deal with as an apostle on his own, when he steps into a place and just starts praying, it breaks open something that someone without the office of the apostle could and so like when Jennifer was here the other week because she carries the office of a prophet and she's a prophet to the nations that's the call that's the appointing and the anointing over here so when she goes into a nation that the Lord has called her to there is some warfare going in but there is breakthrough also that happens because she's appointed and anointed and so This is really important then where we need to become mature disciples 
if you can start to see that. Because as we start to deal with our stuff, the hooks start to come out of our soul and the enemy can't have as much influence over us as he once did. And as we mature, we can also, which comes through obedience to the Lord as well, is that we can actually, when he says, all right, now sing this song as a body or sing these words, it's actually breaking something open. So I know for myself when I lead worship, um, I'll, re- I'll repeat certain phrases and I will have them on repeat. And I know it's irritating, which I apologize. It's not always irritating, but, but, um, but it's because it's, do, it's like getting a truth on a lie and the truth is a hammer and it's just hitting that lie until it's smashed open and then the people can receive the truth. So it all has a purpose and an intention. So even the way that Mark led worship this morning, which was absolutely stunning, thank you team, beautiful, it was a, we have come, so it was a gathering together, coming into unity And then we sung about how he loves us so much. When we hear those words and they melt over us, it actually melts away lies about our identity. It melts away shame. It melts away um, where my sin has defined who I am. It melts away all those things. And you know that because when you come and you stand under it, who you thought you were 10 minutes beforehand isn't even a concept in your mind right now because you're under the waterfall of his love. And so it's breaking off chains. It's setting captives free, setting parts of our hearts free. And then when we started declaring, oh, you're beautiful, we were in just such this this. Oh, I don't even know. It's like this river that went uphill though, not downhill. And it flowed up and it was just coming. And it was like a sweet fragrance to him that I don't know if you could feel the tenderness of it and the beauty of it. The enemy can't stop that. It pierces through. And when we sing worship, when we when we preach, when we equip, when we declare and when we are decreeing everything in alignment with the kingdom of God, it's putting seeds into the heavenly realm. It's changing the way people think. It's changing the way we see things about God. It's changing, it brings peace into homes that we, of people we may never meet. It changes things. It shifts things in the atmosphere. When we pray, the scripture says the prayers of a righteous man avails much. His word goes forth and will not return void. He is faithful to complete all that he has started. When he speaks a word, it goes on assignment. I had this thought the other day that when in agreement with him, when I am speaking in a, like speaking out a prayer of blessing for my family and say I'm praying for um, my daughter and she's, for some reason, whatever, she might choose not to receive it or never be in a place to receive it. But that word doesn't stop with her. That word will continue down her generational line till it hits a mark, someone that will say yes. And I can look in my life and see that because before the salvation of my family, I don't even know where the next lot of Christians would be. And yet every single one of us did a total about face, radical for Jesus and on fire for the Lord. And I think that there was a prayer that was prayed generations ago and that we went, yes, we 
will respond to you, Jesus. I think there's so much we need to, more that we need to understand about the Lord when it comes to prayer. And so this is the role of the church to govern the spiritual realm. That's our job. In Ephesians 1, 19 to 23, it says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at, the right, at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which, his, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And that, that last verse in the Passion Translation, it says, now we, he, now we, his church, are his body on the earth. We are the answer now. Jesus came and he transferred to us. It is now our job Not to wait, to sit back and wait, but to go. To pick up our cross and go. And in Ephesians 3, um, 8 to 10, uh, Paul is, is talking about being called to preach to the Gentiles, unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That means it's our responsibility to let the principalities and the territorial spirits know who is really Lord. And so we do that in prayer. We do we when we go out and we we serve our communities, we're letting them know that we're not going to be stuck in the four walls of a church, of a building, and call ourselves the church because that's not really the church. The church goes and does what the Lord has called them to do. But the church's job is to govern the spiritual realm. We get to say where the blessing comes in and the curse goes out. But it means we also have to take it seriously and understand our authority and who we are. Hang on. Sorry, I'm just like, how much have I got? Um, I'm just going to give you a quick, demonst- uh, a quick picture of what it looks like when a region is delivered from territorial spirits. Um, there's a city called, oh, it's a town actually, called Al Malonga in Guatemala. And in 1974, um, a pastor there was um, had, a, had a gun put to him four times. And each time he prayed, Jesus, deliver me. And when the hammer went down, it didn't fire. The fourth time, he just went, enough's enough. And he called his intercessors, his little, his church actually, to fasting and prayer. And so they were fasting four days a week. And on the Saturday, they would gather to pray. It doesn't say how long they did that for, but they started interceding for their town and they repented for the ancestral worship in their town. It was, uh, it was very rife and the, the alcohol abuse in that town was very prolific um, and it affected everybody. And so soon with the fasting and the prayer, the miracles started happening in their church. And then it started going out of their church. And the town that was once would not hear the gospel started to go, oh, hang on a second, what's going on here? And so now 80% of that town are born again believers. I think we need to pick our side up and just go, oh, we'll just settle for just a little bit. It's like, no, you're going to have the whole lot. (laughs) People stopped drinking and crime continued to decrease for over 20 years. 
They had four prisons that overflowed so much they actually had to bus people to another town to fill their prison. That's a lot of violence and illegal activity. In 1994, the last prison closed. Their hospitals emptied. They saw the land become fertile and they started to see a harvest in the land where carrots that we know are like this big, they were getting them like this big and this fat. I saw pictures of it. It was very impressive. And they are now a prosperous financially as well town because they were in so much poverty. They had shanties that they were all living in, but they have prosperity now. And they have continued to keep prayer and fasting, destroying the works of the enemy, and they continue with the sanctification and consecration process. Um, One of the things I loved that they said, they said it wasn't a theological shift they needed, but rather just to throw themselves into it. So I am going to ask prayer shepherds to stand up if they're in the room. We have a few away today, but if you could just stand up. And then then we have Adele, who's away. Lynn Tipper's away. This very one hand... Of people have carried this community, covered this community in intercession probably for the last two years. Actually, longer. And we just honor you because it has been tiring and it's been hard. But we honor you. We honor you for the cost. Thank you. Sorry, I've got lots of emotion, but the words aren't (laughs) really there. Intercession is a calling on everyone's life. It may not be that you're out in the back room, like, for hours and hours and hours. But he has called every single person that is a born-again believer to the place of prayer. It is a non-negotiable. It is the foundation of the intimacy with the Lord. And it's also the what actually makes anything work. For a church to survive, it must have prayer. You know the first thing that a witch coven will go after? Is the intercessors? Seriously, they are. A small group of people cannot do it on our own. It's it's actually, this is a challenge, which I want to say kindly, but also with a come on guys thing, is that... If we're all called to prayer, who's actually willing to pay the cost of seeing the city of Rockingham come to the Lord or just to have the atmosphere open to them so they can hear the gospel and receive it in, like honestly and truthfully without the blanketing of the rubbish? So I want to challenge you. If prayer, being a prayer shepherd and learning how, like we can equip you on how to be effective. If that interests you, speak to me afterwards. But I also want to encourage you that everything we do needs to be undergirded with prayer. Lilia Haven needs to be undergirded with prayer. The crew needs to be undergirded with prayer. 
chaplains need to be undergirded with prayer. There's just so many things. They all need to be undergirded with prayer. It's the success of, it's the make or break of those things. And so I just really want to encourage you to take your place. Take your place. You are seated in Christ in heavenly places. Take your place. So why don't we all stand, hey? I'm just going to pray. So Jesus, we just thank you, Father, that in all your wisdom, you decided to make your church the gatekeepers, the ones that you desire to govern the spiritual realms in our regions, in our homes, in our cities. And Father God, we just know that no matter what the enemy has, you are so much bigger and you are so much greater. Jesus. Like your word says at the mention of your name, Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And that's talking about those entities, Jesus. We repent for where we've thought that someone else will do it. We repent for where we thought that the enemy was way bigger than God. Jesus, we ask that you would start to unhook us from the regional influence of these territorial spirits. We say yes to the sanctification process. We say yes to the highway of holiness. We say yes to obedience to you, Jesus. We say yes, God. We say yes. And Father God, I just thank you that you are faithful to raise up an intercession on our behalf. But Lord God, we put our hands up and we say we won't leave it to another to do it. We say yes, we will intercede. As a community, we value intercession, Lord. We value prayer. We value our region. We value the mandate you have given us to steward. And we say yes to it, Jesus. We say yes. And I thank you, Jesus, to the victor go the spoils of war, the recompense for when a thief is caught, he must return sevenfold and his household. We just thank you, Jesus. In your precious name, amen. Amen.